Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to Federation Square for the first of the Archbishop's Conversations for 2017. We start by acknowledging the original custodians on the land of the land on which we meet, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations, and pay our respects to their elders past and present. My name is Elizabeth Murray. I'm the Assistant Curate at the Parish of St Silas and St Anselm in Albert Park, and it is my pleasure to be your MC today. Archbishop Philip Freer is joined by Fiona McLeod and Barry Jones to discuss the topic, Is Democracy Broken? And the conversation will be moderated by John Cleary. So to introduce our guests. Fiona McLeod is the President of the Law Council of Australia and practices at the Victorian Bar, appearing in trials and appeals in public law and commercial matters. She has practiced at the Victorian Bar since 1991 and was appointed Senior Counsel in 2003. Ms McLeod is, the, is a past president of the Australian Bar Association and was the chair of the Victorian Bar in 2013. She has been recognised with numerous awards for excellence and leadership for her work in supporting diversity and equality and her work in pro bono and human rights matters, including human trafficking. Ms. McLeod was inducted into the Victorian Honour Roll for Women in 2014 and is the recipient of a prestigious inaugural Commonwealth Government Anti-Slavery Australian Freedom Award. So please welcome Fiona McLeod. And our other guest today, Barry Jones, is a well-respected Labor great and public commentator. Dr. Jones served in both state and federal parliaments, notably as Federal Minister for Science in the Hawke government. He has served the public in many capacities, including as National President of the Australian Labor Party, as a member of the Executive Board of UNESCO, Chair of the Chifley Research Centre's Knowledge Nation Task Force, a member of the Council of National Library of Australia, Chair of the Victorian Schools Innovation Commission, and co-chair of the 1998 Constitutional Convention on an Australian Republic. He is the first and so far only person to be elected as fellow of all four Australian learned academies. He is also a visiting fellow commoner at Trinity College, Cambridge, and a fellow of the Australian College of Educators. He is a prolific author, officially an Australian living treasure, and I believe it is safe to say the only person on the stage today to have a bay in Antarctica named after him. So please welcome Barry James. And we welcome back our moderator, John Cleary. John, <laughs> John is a former ABC presenter who worked extensively in both radio and television. And as a result of his 30 years with the ABC, he is one of the best known commentators on religion, including his work with Sunday nights on ABC local radio and the Religion Report on ABC Radio National. John's career began in Perth. He was a member of the original Compass team and a co-presenter on the philosophy program Meridian in the 1990s. In 2008, John hosted the interfaith event hosted by the Catholic Church in conjunction with World Youth Day and he continues to be in high demand as a speaker and a moderator. So it is our pleasure to have him here today, and I will hand over. Thank you very much for your welcome. The discussion we're about to have today has been catalyzed by several events. I'm sure you could pick your own list, but let me begin with the election of Donald Trump to the United States presidency, closely followed by the Brexit vote in the United Kingdom. They seem to have led to a wave of jeremiads across the Western world, signalling the revolt of the underclass against the failure of neoliberal trickle-down economics. Or, even more alarmist, an impending crisis in liberal democracy as forces as disparate as uncontrolled immigration, climate change and the paralysis of self-serving political institutions undermines the very foundations on which our fragile political institutions rest. In Australia, only 60% of this country's um, citizens believe democracy is the best political system, according to a 2012 Lowy Institute poll. Mainstream political parties in Australia, and we should say around the world, 
seem to be in a crisis as membership collapses and public engagement and trust plummet. But it's not just politics. Public faith in institutions seems in free fall. Whether it's in the exposure of the church's institutional hubris and hypocrisy over child sexual abuse, the cynicism over global institutions such as the United Nations, when just uh, last month Saudi Arabia was elected a member of the United Nations Commission on the Status of Women, a body, quotes, dedicated to the promotion of gender equality and the empowerment of women. This crisis of civic institutions is developing at the worst possible moment. As some are suggesting, we are quite literally paving the way for the perfect storm of human-induced climate change pushing us over the edge into a new dark age. Alarmist enough? Let us begin. <laughs> Archbishop Philip Freer. Um, Many would look at the church as part of the problem for where we are today. The crisis over sex abuse, I've mentioned, but it seems indicative of this loss of confidence in our civic institutions. Where do you see the cracks appearing? I mean, what's caused you to put this item on the agenda for us today? Yeah, thanks, John. Well, I think that you know, all of us uh, have that sense that we're on the precipice of uh, a new tyranny, that the uh, the kind of authority structures that we might have intuitively subscribed to don't look like what hold as well, but what might come to replace them looks uh, even um, scarier or uh, less accountable. And I think we, we see that in some of the, the moods of popularism. I think we see a great volatility of affiliation. Uh, I mean, once it, it was probably that people had fairly stable public identities in respect of uh, a whole, whole range of things that you could probably predict how they'd vote from their occupation, where they lived, uh, their religion. There were a whole lot of things that were a, a stable cluster, I think, that helped constitute our identity in Australian society. And we all know that over the last period of time, and it's probably far more than a generation, probably 50, 60 years, those things have decayed bit by bit. And I think it's always difficult for um, a society to, to transition from uh, almost like an implicit authority-based uh, basis of those structures into something which is more negotiated. So I think to the extent that the church has not been as constructive a player in that, we've got to put our hands up and take responsibility because I think that as you move from those authority structures, uh, the risk is you slide into a, the new tyrannical authority structure without really seeing it. And I think that's because we, we live in a world where we're not particularly examining a whole lot of assumptions. We're still, in a way, projecting our hopes and expectations that some of those old authoritative answers would be produced, particularly by politicians, even though at the same time we probably have less confidence that's likely. So um, I'm sure we'll have a chance to explore this today, but the whole short-termism contrasting to a long-term vision. But yeah, we've got our responsibility to play in the midst of all that. Fiona McLeod, the law is the very basis of our parliamentary democracy. Parliament makes the laws. It's based on a necessary precondition, however, a sort of social contract to accept the rule of law, is the way it's expressed, as the, as the guiding basis of our democracy. Now, part of the appeal, it seems to me, of, of Trump's populism is a sense that in some way that contract has failed, that the rule of law can be replaced by the power of the people or perhaps the leader who gets things done. Are our lawmakers letting us down? I mean, has something happened that's gone awry in the way the machine is operating? Is it within our civic discourse or is it within the nature of the way we're approaching our institutions? Well, I think we all agree that um, the idea that the president could trash this, the uh, authority of the courts in 140 characters or less, as he's done in recent times, is uh, a very great concern. And even this morning or, or yesterday, I think it was, uh, one of our own ministers has been out attacking the courts again for a decision that he didn't like in terms of the uh, refusal to deport um, six migrant workers, uh, uh, six mi uh, refugee applicants. And so we do see this constant temptation to attack that bedrock principle, the rule of law. Um, I, I would say that our democracy has always been very fragile. It's based on that contract that 
to achieve that sense of uh, participation in a public, in a political process, or power by the people, which is what democracy is, we have the exercise of one vote every three or four years, and our representatives make decisions for us. What's changed, I think, is our awareness that we, uh, our, the communication of what it is that they're doing, and our ability to scrutinise what they're doing with such intensity and such uh, short, shallow dips into their, their thinking and their reasoning for it, that they get away with making announcements and then moving on very quickly, as we see Trump do. So in the press room, we see him uh, being questioned about one of his um, lies or one of his announcements, and he quickly flips the conversation, and the press are so keen to put their hands up and ask the next question that they don't allow that depth of discussion. The courts, however, and the protection of the rule of law, which lies in their hands, remains very solid. And I think what we're seeing is that fragility of the processes. We've always seen corruption. We've always seen uh, nepotism. We've always seen oligarchs over-asserting over their power. And the court's ability to rein them in depends on cases coming before them. So we have a sense that the courts aren't able to do their job effectively. And certainly not when they're being attacked and personally criticised. Barry Jones, there's a time not so long ago when uh, the church, as I alluded to with the, the Archbishop, stood in a very different place in the public mind. I can remember personally, as a young member of the, the Brunswick Citadel Salvation Army Band around 1966, being asked to present a pleasant Sunday afternoon concert at the... Albion Street Methodist Church in, uh, in Brunswick, where the guest speaker for the afternoon was an aspiring young politician who encouraged us all to get engaged in our civic and public life. His name was Barry Jones. <laughs> I was you, impressed you then, <laughs> I was impressed then, and I remain so. Is one of the key problems that our agencies of civic literacy have crumbled? Voluntary associations are collapsing places where we learnt the craft of citizenship, uh, they're just not there anymore. And that we have a, a problem in our, in our civic space. Look, back in 1979, there was one of those great turning points um, in modern history. One, one was, of course, the, the, the rise of the Ayatollah Khomeini in Iran. The other was the election of Mrs Thatcher. And Mrs Thatcher said, Famously, there's no such thing as society. There are only individual men and women and their families, but there's no such thing as society. And I'd have to say that one of the great threats to democracy, and 2016 may prove to be another one of those turning points, uh, is that sense that uh, instead of having a collective view about what the public good consists of, now we say the public good is really irrelevant, that its private interest is, pre is predominant. And that's why you've got a falling away from engagement in great public causes, and it's reinforced by the fact that uh, all our major institutions, I've, I can't think of too many exceptions, but not only including the church, but including the banks, including insurance, including both major political parties are seen as being corrupted in some way. The public service has shown that in some areas we thought they were not quite infallible, but they were operating at a good level. Some areas, if you look at institutional, you know, the treatment of children, for example, in our, in our system, and indeed in orphanages and so on, that's been terrible, whether it's been under the church or whether it's been, um, whether it's been under a state institution. So in a sense, you've got a sense of, of that the community as a broad, as a whole doesn't mean anything anymore. It's simply individual interest. And related to that, I mean, no doubt we'll come back to the Trump phenomenon, which is certainly worth engaging. But one of my great concerns has been that we've got, uh, this is the most highly educated cohort that we've ever had in Australian history. Uh, Four and a half million graduates um, in Australia at the moment, and at the moment about a million people in our universities. 
but you'd have to say in terms of public engagement in issues, where are they? And I know so often people who are, have immense experience, have widely travelled, know a lot about the world, and you say, um, you know, how about becoming involved in public causes? And they say, oh, I'm so busy. You know, I've got the vineyard and the yacht and <laughs> skiing at Aspen. And, you know, you can't, you, you can't do it all. And he, no doubt retreats at Lambeth. <laughs> and so the result is you've got a disengagement. Whereas uh, with the populist movement, you'd have to say, whether it's Paul N. Hansen here or... or the Trumpisters in the United States, they're people who have a sense of engagement in their own community because they say, our factory closed down, our employment's at threat, our children uh, have the prospect of insecurity, and so we're going to act together because we recognise a community of interest, whereas the better educated, use that terrible word, elites, the elites say, well, we understand it as an academic problem, we understand it intellectually, but we're not engaged in doing anything about it. Mm -hmm. Archbishop Freer, civic virtue replaced by self-interest. And again, I'll, I'll come back to the, the notion I touched with you earlier about the way the role religion has, has played in this. There are strong links between religion and populism if you, see, if you watch what's happening with the Trump phenomenon and the Brexit phenomenon, whether it's Islam, Christianity or Judaism, it's not just ISIS. You see it in evangelicals supporting Donald Trump. You see it in Putin's wooing of the Orthodox Church to reinforce his value system. You see it in Pauline Hansenite's allusions to a Christian country. The appeal to some sort of civil religion seems to be growing, something that is us. It's, 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 a, it's almost a nostalgia call for a sense of community. Is there a way in which religion as a negative force here can also be a positive force? At the moment it seems to be harnessed in, in the cause of populist retreat. I think, I think that's happening, but I think the other part of the analysis, John, is that there's, uh, there's this kind of clustering around, in, in a sense, single issues or a few issues, and so people who might not have uh, much in common with another party, if they seem to be uh, supporting whatever is a key issue that they've crystallised their concern around, they suddenly become allies. And I think you're probably seeing that with uh, things in the US and in other places. So there's not really a... I think it's a failure of a conception of a common good, for some of the reasons Barry is saying, uh, in that, when, when we live a life that is probably pretty uh, comfortable, uh, our, our personal needs are met, the, the immediate concerns of those we have a, a personal uh, empathy for seem met, I, I think that some, somehow or other our, our ability to have a, an, em, an embracing of a common good, of a bigger picture, is diminished. And I think that we see that probably in, um, broadly in public discourse. So I think that, you know, we've actually seen in, in a curious way, probably one of the, you know, if, if, if I say if, if virtue is, is, is a, a religious quality we see embodied, I think the, um, almost like the hyper-realism of, um, of uh, military sacrifice, we've seen that really developed uh, as, as one of the, um, the national narratives in Australia. Mm. So the, uh, you know, the incredible respect and, uh, and public censure of anyone who doesn't share that respect of, uh, mm. of our military legacy, I think has come to uh, be put forward, I think imperfectly, but, but put forward as one of the unifying um, narratives of virtue. Now, I think that only goes, it only goes as far as it goes. It's, it's a very limited thing because it's a, uh, it's a much more mixed story. But uh, I, I think we, we're always searching for those things, and I think that uh, institutions like Christian churches are still transitioning from really feeling they, they had the, uh, the public narrative that they could tell back to the public and, and have it accepted, whereas clearly we're not in that situation. So we, we, have to, we have to live with our reality and engage in that, but I think there is still a, a story that Christian churches and other entities in our society need to engage with and need to be confident that we can debate, because in another way we've got into a, a kind of a curious 
uh, sort of situation where uh, we've almost, um, you know, any assertion kind of gets, it gets accepted a bit as it having an internal validity as an assertion, but I think we're not very good at debating them. Mm. And, uh, and so uh, it, it's at the strident end of, of criticism and almost like hate speech, you get the engaging with the negative side of the ideas, but not in the discourse. And I think there's something, uh, we're very anxious about that as a society, about having you know, proper discourse about, and, and debate and engagement about things that matter. We, we get into a, and I think, you know, uh, political correctness is the, is the secular version of piety. We get into a situation where, in a way, you mark yourself as a member of, of the respected class of society by the things you would dare not critique, even if you wanted to. Well, that, that, that marvellous book by Ken Inglis called, uh, I think it's called Sacred Sites, mm. in which he talks about Anzac as a kind of uh, mm. civic religion. Mm. And say, so, oh, well, not, not RC or C of E, we're AIF. <laughs> <laughs> but if you, look, if you look at those, that narrative, who, what is our mythology around greatness? It is the digger, it is the sportsman, it is the larrikin. Mm -hmm. And what's common about all of those? They're mm. male. Yeah. Mm. And they're white, mm. for yeah. the most part. So who's being excluded here? I mean, we, we have a conversation about disengagement. Mm. I would argue that our kids are actually not disengaged, and nor is my generation, looking around the room, the people who are prepared to come out at 7.30 in the morning do seem to reflect uh, a certain generation. But my generation, well, which is great, because <laughs> you're obviously all engaged, but, but my generation had the knowledge and the resignation that we couldn't affect change. So you see the image of a polar bear on a shrinking ice floe. You see the image of a three-year-old face down on a beach, dead, attempting to seek mm. asylum. Mm. And we despair and we're filled with grief, but we don't know how to act on it. Mm. And when my children say to me, and they rant and say, you didn't fix climate change, you've destroyed the planet. I say, that's true. We had the knowledge, but we didn't have political power. Yeah. You have new ways of asserting political power. You have get up and a vase and all the rest where you can assert your political power through numbers. You have social media that you can capture these images that move people. You have a, a way of telling a new narrative that includes our first people, for example, mm -hmm. and their historical lessons about how to live in harmony with the land, that includes people of diverse backgrounds, and that can create a new narrative for all of us, not one that excludes because some government tells me that mateship is my culture and my morality, mm -hmm. which I don't accept. Mm. But look, on, on that question, you see, the problem about numbers is numbers are very perplexing. If you look at the two major political parties, uh, their total membership on paper is probably about 80,000. That's on paper. Mm. The actual number of real live human beings in the political parties may be as few as 30,000 mm. nationwide. And yet, partly because of the way in which the system operates, compulsory voting and public funding of elections, which, both of which I agree with in theory, but I can see that it has the effect, it armour plates mm. two political structures, the two hegemonic parties, in a way they're armour plated. You can't blow them out of the equation. And so you've got millions of people who are hand ringers say, oh, we can't do anything about it. And I remember when, when the, we were back in the days of the Hawke government, when we were, um, when uh, Hawke and Keating, when they were talking to each other, when Hawke and Keating were proposing these enormous, very rapid economic changes, and the, the, the ministry went along rather weakly, and even though we disagreed with a number of the points, I remember saying to Michael Duffy, um, I said, how can, how can Hawke get away with, with so much? Because he had only four supporters. He said, it's a matter of numbers. He said, there's four of them and there's only 23 of us. <laughs> <laughs> Let me introduce another element, Barry, because you've touched on it. It goes back to your book, Sleepers Wake. The impact, of techno <laughs> <laughs> the impact of technology that 
the, the, the benefits of mass communication technology have been enormous, but at the same time, in the last two years, we've seen their impact on absolutely destroying the model on which media and news communication works. Fairfax is hemorrhaging, News Limited is, Limited is struggling, we're seeing specialist journalists pulled out of, of Parliament, we're seeing news disseminated through YouTube, Facebook and Google owning, basically, our means of mass communication, and people reduced to talking to each other through their narrow YouTube channels and their echo chambers. We're no longer getting a broad view of who we are as national polities. We're getting privatised, almost isolated pods of discussion. Now, and the ABC is caught up in this as well. Well, look, I, I got a lot of things right in Sleeper's Wake, but the thing I got spectacularly wrong was about the impact of the information technology revolution. I thought with the IT revolution, it would open the world up, that people would have access to instant information, that that would mean that the level of political debate would, would be better, people would be looking at data, they'd be analysing it, we'd all be better informed. And in fact, what it's led to has been, it's emphasised the role of the personal and the immediate and the short term. And it's contributed to a quite unimaginable degree into the infantilization of our political process. Mm. And, uh, uh, that, and it also means that because um, you're, you're able to find, as Pauline Hansen helpfully suggested about vaccination, you're able to find your own data mm. somewhere which supports your point of view, then the idea that there might be expert opinion of some sort is, is un, unacceptable. Now, there are a couple of things related to that. One is the concept which has been hurled around a lot about political correctness. What they re and, but it's never defined. And what they really mean by political correctness is that people who have expertise in an area might be worth listening to on a subject. That if you're from the Bureau of Meteorology, you might know a bit about climate change. But the other view is to say, well, that's just their opinion. <laughs> and, and that's an elitist view. So the result is that um, uh, this selectivity really reflects, though, something which is a fundamental dilemma about the democratic process. And I, I just toss it in and just mm -hmm. brood about it. We don't, won't come up with an answer today, but to say, we all agree with the principle of, of one person, one vote, and that votes are of equal value. Now, if, I, if we had a straw poll and said, how many are in favour of the idea of one person, one vote, you know, voting equality, we'd all put our hands up. Well, I think we'd all put our hands up. <laughs> OK, if you say, does that mean every opinion is of equal value? Mm. And you think, well, uh, hang on. Well, no, I wouldn't exactly go as far as that. But say, but. But the point is, we, we say, well, you've got the premise of one person, one vote. That means in terms of determining an election outcome, that matters. You're saying you don't take their opinion equally. And if you say, if you're really convinced that the earth is flat and you want to say it, and then even though there may be a majority of you against it, does that deprive you of the right to saying it? Mm -hmm. And so the result is that you've got, in a sense, an atomization or a fragmentation of opinion because it's taken for granted that scientists say an issue like climate change are just another lobbying group. Mm -hmm. They're pushing for their own self-interest, they're pushing for more grants, mm -hmm. and that you've got to treat them in the same way that, say, that free marketeers used to attack the shirt makers or the shoe makers mm -hmm. to say, well, they would say that, mm -hmm. wouldn't they? They're pushing their own vested interest. Mm -hmm. Now, that's the whole issue. One man, one, sorry, ooh, whoops. One person, one vote, yes, but every... And then you say, well, what is more important? Is evidence important or is it opinion? Because in a sense, uh, I mean, I always like that quotation from uh, uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, former US senator from New York, but who used to say, everyone's entitled to their own opinion, but they're not entitled to their own facts. You can't just make it up as you go along. 
But here again, we see an erosion of trust. Mm. So science used to be, at least for me, was the great answer. You mm. would have an empirical testing mm. of a proposition to prove or disprove. Mm. And we trusted the science. We trusted, for example, the Bureau of Meteorology, who were telling us over and over again that science change was a real thing. But now we discover, say, that a multinational has been funding the research. Mm. Suddenly we don't trust the answer anymore, and we know that the multinationals are wheeling out their own people to tell us clean can be, a coal can be clean, yep. or that oil and gas is good for humanity, or whatever it is. Um, so we, we, again, we lose our trust in the institution of science as a keeper of uh, truth, if you oh, like. Yeah. And that, that is a grave concern to me, that we uh, don't trust the science anymore. Because I, I think most of us in this room would have a sense that if 90% you know, of the global scientists uh, who are looking at climate change tell us this is a real thing and we need to act, we would, we would say you should design policy around a response to that. Whatever the policy outcome is, you might not like, you might do this, you might do something else, you might do something else or a whole raft of things, but something should be done. But instead, we've gone into this great paralysis captured by the idea that there are, there are special interests at work here. Yep. But John, I think, you know, to your point about the collapse of, um, say, institutions like newspapers, well, what are they being replaced by? You probably see that on some of the, the web-based information, which a lot, of, a lot of which is actually driven by mathematical algorithms of people's interests. So you've actually, if you look at any, you know, what you might think is a, is a reasonably or, or, or should be a credible website, even, you know, like a Fairfax uh, online mm. version of the age of the Sydney Morning Herald, but you suddenly see amongst the things that are up there, you, you'll get, um, you know, what once would have been in the odd spot at the bottom in the fine print of the front page of the age, mm. suddenly is up there in the second or third most interesting mm. thing. Yeah. And, and, and so we're, we're I, th I think we've got a problem with that because the, yeah, Editorial uh, distortion well, I think is, 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 it's, is it's, being it's, driven it's by It's been done criteria. by a computer, mm -hmm. or it's been done by marketing, and then alongside you can get all sorts of, uh, you know, to me, look totally specious claims for advertising. But um, there's this, this sort of harvesting of information, and, and so things can be on Twitter or Facebook. The computers harvest their, uh, the interest level as shown, and that suddenly generates them into credible news sources as actual news, even though they can be entirely specious. So I think we've got some... I think that, that actually is a real threat to our democracy. The, oh, the, yeah. The, mm. the collapse in criteria of judgment mm. is, is, is a deeper one, though, than the, some of the things we've alluded to. One could, would, one could point, for instance, to the, the way in which the advertising industry, starting from, say, the, the invention of mass communication, has begun to corrupt the way we use value words, but you could take it even to, to the high academic left and the rise of, of post-modernity and, and ethical relativism. These are, are things which have pushed very hard in the deep background, if you like, of high culture mm. and had a profound influence on popular culture. Barry, and that's something you've well, about look, as well. Uh, if you haven't heard the name Cambridge Analytica, write it down and... Uh, see when the name when you come across the name next i've been reading a bit about this uh, firm called cambridge analytica who worked on the trump campaign their claim is possibly slightly exaggerated but their claim is that they can read from your iphone and your computer mm. they can have four to five thousand points of identity mm. about you mm. they know your strengths and weaknesses, mm. if any. They know the kind of people who that they might, mm. to whom, say, misogyny is, is powerful, uh, to whom anti-Catholicism or pro-Catholicism mm. is powerful. And they, they claim that they can predict with 80% degree of accuracy how people will vote at any given time. So the result is that you had, coming out of Cambridge Analytica's work, and they're also consultants I need hardly tell you, to the Russian government as well, mm -hmm. um, that Cambridge Analytica mm -hmm. are able to provide this fantastic amount of information that you've provided for, to them without being aware of it. And the, you see, the thing is that so many of the really important issues that are going on are outside public scrutiny and not really properly understood. And, and the result is that it's not surprising that 
say, our election processes are so banal. You know, you had the choice of the last election between the timid party and the tepid party. <laughs> <laughs> So we, ha we have now the sophisticated focus group <laughs> with those analytics. Well, the sophisticated uh, focus groups, you see, say, don't go there. Mm. Don't go on that issue. So if you take an issue, say, like, like uh, uh, just leave climate change for a moment, think about the treatment of asylum seekers. Mm. You see, that's, a, that's an appalling example of where something that I think we could call I don't know whether this is a coinage of mine, but call the, the fallacy of the false antithesis mm -hmm. to say, look, you've got to treat refugees harshly because the only alternative is for them to drown at sea. Mm -hmm. You've got option one is drown at sea, uh, and, and uh, option two is beat them up in Manus mm -hmm. or, or, or Nauru. There are no, there are no third possible. You say, yes, there are. You can debate the issue out, you can look at it statistically, mm. analytically, and you say, well, neither of the two parties are doing it, because both parties, one party says, we'll be cruel, and the other party says, we'll be really, really cruel. Mm. Yeah. And think, oh, yeah, well, that seems to be, you know, the, the public will buy that. Mm. And, and to some extent they do, because an alternative position isn't put. Mm. And what's driving that in so much? And I, Fiona, I'd ask you about this. Is there seems to be the real currency in politics at the moment, and this is right across the Western world, is fear. Mm. That is, oh, there yeah. is a visceral fear. Yep. And law has been traditionally seen as one of the, the, the barricades against fear. That is, the law will protect you. Yes. As the law as an institution in some way complicit in the way it is being used, well, the law doesn't traditionally speak out in defence of particular issues. So you have uh, a response to issues through the court where you might get a case-by-case -case analysis of what's going on. But you're, you're very right. If you think of a Kennedy presidency, for example, that was a presidency that built support through messages of hope and aspiration. More recent times, we've seen presidencies and prime ministerships based on fear. I completely agree with you. It's be afraid because your family will this, or this will happen, or this war will come, or we hate the Russians, or we hate somebody else. And it's been very effective because we are afraid. There's always something we fear. There's always something we need. Or there's something we want that's above what we've got. So we're very susceptible to that sort of manipulation, I think. And where the law can protect is by saying, you are now overreaching your power. You, minister, do not actually have the, the ability to take this executive action and you will be constrained. Let's, let's think about Trump. So he made an announcement that seven countries would be banned from entering the United States. He had, uh, he had a Congress and a Senate and he had a, a balance on the Supreme Court, the ultimate court. Who came out and defended those people and sat on the floor at JFK and other airports around America? The Civil Liberties Union and the Migrant Resource Centres, the legal services, sitting on the floor in those airports with their laptops open, plugged into the plugs in the wall, drafting writs of habeas corpus to have people released. I've got to tell you, that filled me with optimism because I thought there's still a constitution in America and there are still people prepared to see it enforced. We don't have the protection of a Bill of Rights no. in Australia. And that's something that is a gaping hole, because in case by case, the courts have to look and say, is this an implied protection in the Constitution, or has there been an overreach of power between the Commonwealth and the states? If we had a Bill of Rights, we'd have a bedrock for the courts to look to and say, here's how we interpret this. These are the fundamental rights. You are now encroaching, and you do not pass go, do not collect 200. John, I'm just thinking that whether it's mining big data or a focus group, all these really do is uh, tell us more about ourselves, mm. And so it's a, it's a bit of a feedback loop. And I think that's the part that people get dissatisfied about because we actually know, if we know ourselves, the failings of our human nature, the lack of our vision, you know, the meanness of our spirit often when we're faced with difficult alternatives. And so you, you put it all together by sophisticated computer analytics or clever people sitting and um, or doing you know, phone polls or robocalls or whatever, you act, it, does, it doesn't actually tell you anything new. And so I think if you start getting political leadership that 
is always, you know, who, whose vision is, is only for the next election yeah. and, and whose data is only the kind of a collective uh, anxiety or concern, it's hardly surprising that you, 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 you don't do actually anything very virtuous at all, a very wicked kind of a feedback loop where uh, all these things are being magnified back to us. And no wonder we'd be dissatisfied because for whatever reason, you know, we, we are, as the members of the society, in, in a way, the inventors of our politics. We're not just the unhappy victims of it. Let's talk then for a moment, given that we've sort of done the Jeremiah stuff, <laughs> about possible ways forward. Mm. And let me come to, um, to religion. We've mentioned it as a negative force. But when we see the collapse of civic institutions, if, if you have a look across the world, churches are one of the few civil institutions that remain transnational and can talk to each other. If you look, for instance, say, at a problem like Afghanistan, one of the arguments that's presented is that the reason the Taliban continue to come back as successful agents in Afghanistan is because, as bad as they are, they at least represent some moral coherence against the sort of corruption of various warlords. Where are we to find a transnational sense of Civic trust. There used to be a word that we, we, and we still use it, commonwealth, the commonwealth of Australia. It spoke of a concept of shared burdens and shared benefits. Mm, mm. That, that sense of common purpose, of shared ideals, now has to be seen transnationally. Mm. Are there institutions, is there hope in the system, or are we, do we need to be basically totally pessimistic and say, no, it's stuffed? Climate change is the, is the great cliff that we're about to fall off. I think, I think there's, there's hope as long as people have uh, connections which are bigger than the, the smaller identities they might revert to. So all of the things you're talking about, and there probably are many, but churches would be one of them, religious organisations, international connections people have through all sorts of means, I think encourage a conversation across the small boundaries of imagination and as we... In, in a curious kind of way, in, in a much more globalised world where, where transnational organisations in the corporate world probably have, uh, in many cases, far more influence and power than, than actual national governments, but we're still, in our imagination, seeing this kind of national identity and even a contention for what it is by a dominance of one group over another group to the exclusion of others. Probably see that in, you know, continually in Africa and other places with the the, the, uh, the idea of a, a hegemonic state where someone controls it, those ideas are still reactive. So any, any discussion across those boundaries, I think is a source for hope. And I think that uh, any, any institution that publicly and open to cr criticism casts uh, a vision for the future is a very constructive thing for our society. Fiona, where do you see signs of hope? Are you sort of an optimistic or pessimistic about well, this? Well, I'm an optimist. You mentioned the Commonwealth. The notion of common heritage or common wealth is actually something well established in Roman and English law. It was a notion that no individual owned particular lands or, or areas. They were there for the common benefit. Rivers, seas, coastal areas, and we extended that to the moon, Antarctica and so on. Yeah. This notion that the lands could, or rivers could not be owned by individuals. They were held by the Crown as a trustee on behalf of all citizens to use or navigate freely. And misuse of those lands was, uh, by commercial exploitation or adverse possession, was, according to the doctrine, a misuse against all the community. And so when we talk about uh, the concept of community, I think that's where the answer is, and it comes back to this theme of participation. We can't solve the tricky problems of our generation. We can't solve uh, corruption, climate change, slavery, exploitation, all of these enormous issues we have without working in the common interest. Multinationals do not necessarily work in the common interest. They work for their shareholders, which are a small group but they must be brought into the, the, the regime of rights and responsibilities if we're going to solve those problems. And individuals need to have a way to have a sense that they are protecting the lands for all time. They are protecting lands and uh, our seas and our climate and all the rest 
for our future generations. It's not an individual purpose, it's a common purpose. And I guess that would probably make me a communist. But uh, <laughs> uh, that's the notion that we're working at. It, a, a, and I think that notion, if we can work towards mm. that, does give me a sense of optimism. Mm. Barry, where do you see signs of hope? Oh, well, look, I, look I, I, I'd like to put the case for pessimism. I mean, I think... <laughs> <laughs> I think the situation is, is very bad at a whole number of levels. First of all, let's say this. This is, this is Australian exceptionalism, if you like. We've got the weakest parliament relative to the, the strength of the executive. You see, in the United States, if you go to war, mm. Congress has to be involved. In the Great Britain, the House of Commons has to be involved. In Australia, the view is it's got nothing to do with the parliament. What would they know? So that decisions about war and peace are made entirely by the executive. And so much material is denied to the parliament, the parliament's not really a represent, no wonder it's become a kind of hollow, hollow sham. Much of what goes on in government is not subject to, to accountability. The role of minders, the role of lobbyists, the role of spin doctors, that's all absolutely secret. And you've got two craven major political parties who simply are obsessed with the next election. I happen to be a life member of the... I can't resign, you see, because I'm a life member of the... <laughs> I've got to die first, but it, it, the, the, my card says... See, it actually is printed, it says, proud Labour life member, and I think that's not an accurate description. I, so I've, I've whited out the proud, except of using the term as in proud flesh. But, um, and I think if they said queasy or uneasy or equivocal or something, that would be more like it. But proud, no, I can't really quite, quite do that. But the result is that you, you will find a lot of people who will smugly say, well... You've got to vote for us because we're better than the other mob. And that, that's all they say. They say. We're fractionally better than the other mob. And, and that's what they do. So you won't have engagement in serious issues. And just for a minute, going back, you see, that appeal to fear has become all, all persuasive or, you know, all, all encompassing in a way. You can see that once we had the idea with the Commonwealth of having an embracing mm. kind of sense, now it's an exclusion to say, you see those people up mm. there? They're your enemies. Mm. Mm. They're out to get them. You're out, they're out to get you. Mm. But mm. we're both white males mm. of a certain age, <laughs> uh, in, a, in a spectrum. Um, you know, let's, let's operate again. Mm. And it's so extraordinary. You talked about the churches. You see, the problem there... A profound difference between what you might loosely call uh, the Rowan Williams kind of Anglican mm. and fundamentalists, fundamentalism. Mm. Now, you'd have to say mm. that the fundamentalists in, in uh, the Muslim world and the fundamentalists uh, of, of the lunar right within the Christian community have a lot in common because they believe in absolutes and you can't question it. And I thought one of the weirdest things that came out in the Trump campaign was uh, when the fundamentalists, given Trump's prior history, when the fundamentalists were asked, should we vote for Trump? Mm. They said, it's God's test of your faith. Mm. You mightn't think on the face of it, he's God's candidate in the election, but he is. <laughs> because, and that's a fundamentalist view. You can't challenge it. Now that's horrific, but that's the world we're in. So what's the way through? I mean, do I, do I now look at that man who is an aspiring young politician 40 years ago in Brunswick called on everybody to be part of civic engagement saying, a plague on all your I, houses. I've reached the stage Begone of thinking cruel there's, world. There, there's perhaps a case to be made for the suicide bomber. I mean, <laughs> really. I mean, I think the situation is so, is so bad. I think the level of discourse about major issues is contemptible. And you can see that organisations, take our 38 universities, which we've hardly mentioned, universities going through a difficult time from their point of view, but they're silent. They're silent. You've got a handful of really outstanding vice-chancellors, 
But on the whole, I think with, our, um, with the universities, for example, are so defensive because they say, oh, we're, 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 we're being confined, we're moving away from research, more and more to simply our teaching function and so on. But, well, you know, we better hang on because we can't offend them. So maybe that just means that we don't have the answers, but we shouldn't assume that our young people don't. I mean, individually and collectively, we're some of the most, as you said, educated yeah. and privileged people on the planet at yep. any time in our history. And so uh, if we have a sense of despair that we can't solve the problem, and we're not prepared to stand up and inspire young people and empower them to solve the problem, maybe we should get out of the way. Because I do have a sense that they don't have that despair. They're looking through their, their news feeds and their 140 character tweets for answers, and they're looking for ways to engage. And they're looking to be inspired. They really but are. But you've got to look for new structures and new leadership. Mm. And one of the problems about providing that leadership is you need to find a kind of cater, shall we say, of, of people who are capable of generating inspiration, but who are prepared to give up their own careers for X years to say, look, here's a crisis. Are you prepared to play some sort of leadership role? It's going to have a damaging effect on your own professional Mm. Uh, potential uh, and, and, and may not succeed in the end, but is it worth the try? Mm. Is it perhaps that out of the crisis that we, we see impending, climate change, that we see the beginnings of a solution for our, our polity? Because it's there that science tells us what is happening and here are the solutions. It's there that religion all religions talk about the meaning and purpose of existing on the planet. It's there that our civic institutions have to rest if they're going to take us forward. That is, there, that out of, it seems to me that, that out of many of the great crises emerge solutions. It was out of the ruins of the Second World War. We got the United Nations, we got those other institutions. That at, at the bleakest moment, there is hope em emergent. Well, I'd like to think that was right, but as, I mean, this is something that Malcolm Fraser and Mike Richards in the audience used to talk about interminably in the period up to his death. And he said, no, no, we've got to have a new political configuration. We didn't work out a, a name for it, but his argument was that it would be based on courage and it would be based on integrity and it would be based on, on evidence and data. You talk about climate change. If you take my own beloved party, what is its position on coal mining, for example? Well, it depends on where you are. In, in, in Victoria, the government's taken a courageous line about Hazelwood. OK, Western Australia, no idea what the Labor government's position there. Queensland, they're very hot to trot on Adani mm. uh, because they say it'll create 1,462 jobs. Mm. Uh, many of them in Townsville. So suddenly it's a big issue there. Mm. So it makes it very difficult. Is it possible for Bill Shorten and his uh, shadow minister for climate change to take a consistent position? You say, well, it's going to be a bit difficult depending on where you are. If you're in Queensland, you're going to take one point of view. In South Australia, probably quite a courageous mm. point of view with, with, with weather all. Western Australia, don't know. Victoria, pretty good. Tasmania, well, they're into... Uh, into um, hydro anyway. Uh, so the result is that you, as soon as you see you've got vested interest, local interest, and the argument would be just as you can't tackle, say, a serious problem like gambling, because you'd find pressure groups would be applying serious money to defeat you. You can't do anything about the sugar industry, because they say, oh, if we do anything about sugar, that's good for the Hansen cause. Mm. So Einstein said you can't solve a problem at the same level at which it was created. Mm. If you talk to individual MPs today, just as you yep. were, Barry, they're all concerned about hardship people are facing, yeah. injustice in their own communities, and they all want to do something. Most backbenchers don't have the ability to elevate those issues into policy that are adopted by Cabinet. 
But we as human beings, I think, need a way to participate more actively. We're adaptive, we're curious. En masse, we can solve enormous problems with or without artificial intelligence to assist us. So we have the capacity within us to be curious beings and to participate. And that's why I'm optimistic, because I think even though this has happened very quickly to us with the advance in, in technology and social media, we will adapt and we will find new ways to explore what it means to be a human being and to have good outcomes for all of us. Philip Freer, as Archbishop, spiritual leader of the Anglicans in this city, you know, you're, you're compelled to be an optimist. No, like I'm, I'm compelled to take the whole range of uh, data together. <laughs> the, the, uh, the things we know about the imperfectibility of our human nature, I think the vision of a common good, and uh, I think a sense of, um, to me, a, the, the value of a, a divine purpose which uh, we see in the endowment of the gifts we have in creation, and all of the things that we're talking about that give us the capacity to problem solve, but it's always in a, it's always in a mix. So um, I, I wouldn't be I wouldn't be op optimistic, but I'd be I'd be hopeful because I think there is a great resilience. I agree there is a, 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 some some wonderful young people who have a, a compelling and beautiful vision, and I think a willingness to uh, to sacrifice vir virtuously for the vision they have about a future society. So look, I, I uh, can I give any guarantee that we're not on the on the way to that that future going to go through unhappy things? I couldn't at all, because I think I know enough about our, the perversity of our human nature to think that there's the, the likelihood of, um, of any number of disasters on the way ahead, but there is a beautiful resilience of the human spirit and people against the odds who break across those boundaries and actually help conceive and project a vision of the common good. Well, we've skated across a, a very fragile pond um, this morning, we've, we've touched some of the issues which may be touching you. There are a few moments that we might uh, have for some questions before we have to, uh, to wind things up. Good morning. Thank you very much for a very interesting discussion. Uh, my name is Roy Carter. Um, I have a whole bunch of ideas. I feel completely disempowered. And I have a whole bunch of ideas for parliamentary reform. How would anybody go about changing parliament. And one question up the back. I'm uh, writing a book on what I'm calling loving, inclusive, spiritual values. After a lifetime of social activism and the union movement and climate change, one of the things I'm concerned about is individuals, particularly young people, lacking an experience of personal spiritual strength. I'd like to uh, know the panel's comment on that. Well, perhaps Fiona, given that we start on the rule of law, that question about our structures of government, a brief comment for you. It's, it's really tricky because our structures of parliament are locked in to the constitution and we know if you want to change the constitution, you need a referendum. See how difficult it is for our indigenous people at the moment to generate momentum for some sort of mechanism to amend the constitution, to recognise them, to empower them, and to give them some role where they might participate in our processes. Uh, very difficult, because we have bipartisan um, support for a general idea, but no real encouragement for that to be a meaningful participation yet. It all comes down to political will, and ultimately, Politicians follow what they see as a clear expression of political will. If each of us at the ballot box, once every three or four years, said, you must address climate change, or we're going to not vote for you, that's one mechanism, obviously. But another is to uh, make direct representations to MPs. Now, Barry will know whether or not those things are effective. But the way I've found most effective to speak to politicians, for example, funding uh, legal community centres or legal services recently, where we saved some money in the budget, or they found some money in the budget, was directly to communicate to those individual MPs about the hurt and the hardship that people were experiencing and have them focus on that aspect so that they all want to do the right thing. It's just um, uh, difficult for them to find the money because they keep 
telling this story about f financial constraint. But in terms of reform of parliament itself, yes, you would need to uh, revisit our constitution, our, our legislative constraints, but one thing that we can do is we can hold politicians to account. We've seen the most extraordinary assertion in the last few years of executive power outside the constraints of the administrative orders and the structures that give ministers power to act. They assert a power to act and nobody calls them to account. For example, uh, the former Prime Minister purported to give instructions to the Climate Change Institute that they weren't to pursue policy on wind, I think it was. Yeah. Uh, now, that is completely outside his mandate, but nobody challenged that. And the Institute said, well, we don't want to fall out of political favour, or we've had an instruction from the PM, or that must be right, if he's telling us we can't do this, then therefore we shouldn't. As an independent body, statutory body, they had to fulfil their mandate, which was to look at renewables. So nobody's challenging these things, and maybe that's another aspect, is we need to bring these issues before the court with test litigation and have them teased out so that governments, when they get it wrong, and inevitably they do, are held to account by means of judicial review, and uh, they have to go back to the drawing board and redraw the policy. As we saw with the kids in detention here recently in adult jails, governments held to account, these are the rights of the individuals, you must act accordingly. But the big reform issue, that's a hard one. Barry. Look, I, I, think, I think reforming the way the parliament operates is perhaps a second order issue. But what you've got to recall, the, the most important thing is people live in the delusion that members of parliament are there essentially because there's a bottom-up process from the electorate. On the whole, that's not the case. They're there because, um, because one of two party structures have picked somebody uh, and generally because they've worked their way up through a faction or they're mm. part of an interest group and so on and the electorate simply go along with it. The point is you won't change the parliament until you change the electorate. The electorate's got to be directly involved and want to operate at a, at a higher level, not fear driven but knowledge driven. Archbishop, let's uh, move to the second question that was asked about young people and the sort of spirituality in a, in a broader sense, the, the value, core values that drive, that should drive. Yeah, well, I think the question was, uh, was really searching about the, uh, I suppose, the, the opportunities of young people developing a, uh, a passionate spirituality that equip them to maintain motivation and I'm reading things in between the lines of what your question was, but to maintain their motivation for good and a big vision when there are a lot of discouragements on the way. And uh, uh, I, th I think that, you know, I, I run into schools where they, they try and foster that through um, community service experiences, through, you know, outdoor education experiences, through developing the person. But I think these, these are... These are hard things to, to engineer because we're, if you're looking for the, you know, the, the inner spark and motivation that, um, that makes one person resolve to keep going despite discouragement uh, and uh, when things look more, when they in fact demonstrate themselves to be more complicated than they are, th these, are these are profoundly deep things. And I think that um, we've seen, because we, we idolise, or some of us do anyway, you know, sort of politicians of an earlier era who were, in a way, self-taught people who were, you know, honest engine drivers or, or people who read books and, you know, educated themselves and developed that kind of, through, in a way, transcending the adversity of their life experience. And as we live increasingly in a time of, of privilege, where we're getting a bit of a polarised society where the people who often have this vision are on the more privileged side of the kids in our society yeah. and there's a whole other bunch of kids who in a way are ground down into the inevitability of, uh, of their life not being a whole lot richer or you know they can't imagine a bigger future than they probably see around them. So I think that we, we've got structural things in our society which are locking more and more people into deeper and more complex uh, identity as, as not participating in society and other people who will have generous and big ideas and I know you know kids from some of the schools I mix with which are pretty privileged kids in pretty privileged schools are wonderful young people but they and chances are if they're at all have a bent towards politics 
they will be very successful because they're smart kids, they know some of the, the situations, but it's really, you know, you really want this across the whole society. So I'm, I'd be very interested in this project because I think we need to, to get ordinary, ordinary kids who live in situations where, you know, their own destiny seems reasonably limited and shaped by their, their socioeconomic circumstances to have an access into a big vision as well because they'll be, they'll be people who really do have, a, uh, you know, the combination of character uh, and transcending circumstance and struggle uh, and embracing their vision. And I think that's look, important in society. Look, look can, can I hop into that? Because it's something I've been thinking about a lot, and I was talking to a group the other night about this. I mean, I'm old enough to remember when you had people in the parliamentary party, say, who were missing a finger or two, oh. or perhaps had lost an eye, or had been damaged in an industrial accident. Mm. And when they spoke about they spoke about their life experience. Mm -hmm. Now you've got people who are immaculately groomed and well-spoken and holding degrees and so on. And if you said to them, would you be prepared to go to jail in defense of your principle, they'd have an attack of the vapors. And it never really <laughs> occurred to them that it was like that. So the result is that you had people who out of life experience, but now too often, and Every week at the university, somebody will come to say, I'd like to have a career in politics. And I say, how interesting. <laughs> yes. Do you have any strong views? And they'll say, oh, what, what do you recommend? <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, a, it's a very worthwhile inquiry, if I may so so. Because I think this issue about spirit reflects our sense of disconnection. Yeah. Our disconnection from ourselves, our disconnection from our ability to affect any change, our disconnection from our communities and from the planet. You know, a lot of kids don't know where food comes from anymore. Yeah. They, don't, they don't know that you have to put your hands in the dirt to get a potato. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that if there's a project that's focusing on spirituality, <clears throat> This, this is something other continents are very good at. The Indians build spirituality in it into their daily practice, and it's part of everything they do. And I, I do think it's a conversation that we have left to the churches and haven't had mainstream at all. So, uh, Thank you. Um, my name's Frank Rosen. Um, I'd call myself a sceptical investigator. Um, it seems to me that discussions like this could tend to just degenerate to shuffling the deck chairs um, on the sinking ship of state or whatever. Um, I think surely we're trying to reach down to the foundational um, worldviews, uh, the driver of our impulses. And uh, it seems that we could trace the problems that we're facing to the foundational worldview that says we just evolve pond scum. There's no purpose, it's blind, pitiless indifference. Yet it does seem to me that there are emerging trends in science that are indicating the validity of the old biblical worldview. Uh, the timeline, the historical timeline. And if that is validated, then perhaps we're looking at a biblical ending, the ap apocalyptic uh, scenario of revelation. Perhaps, if that's likely, we would translate our institutional um, uh, organisations, our, our policies in Parliament. I was going to say. <clears throat> oh, okay. Um, well, perhaps I'm, I'm suggesting we should give thought to the new emerging uh, revelations in science. Um, there was a talk about a vision of a, of a common good. Internationally, we have Amnesty and Oxfam, obviously, locally get up, but my question is why aren't the Greens ever mentioned in these sort of discussions? They have certainly a vision for the common good and they're extremely intelligent, passionate people and they don't have 
vested interests. They're not doing it just to win votes because they're unlikely to get into power. But they're never mentioned in the media, in discussions Thank like you. this. Well, just on the revelations question, I mean, I think apocalyptic thinking is it's not just a religious phenomenon anymore, it's a secular phenomenon. You have everything from the clash of civilizations to, to other things. Is apocalyptic thinking something that's useful or not, I think, is, is one thing um, in this um, current climate? Barry, briefly on that. I think the danger about the apocalyptic thinking is that it, it actually paralyzes mm -hmm. uh, action. You say, well, if we're going to have an apocalypse, not much you can do about it. Going on to the question about the, about the Greens, look, I'm very sympathetic to Green causes. I suppose in some ways, ideologically, I'd see myself as close to the Greens. The reality is that at the Commonwealth level, um, uh, I think there's an acceptance that, that it is, rightly or wrongly, a two-horse race. And that while uh, you, can, you can express a vote for the Greens as a you could make that as an expressive vote, you know that in the end, the preference is going to go somewhere else and the preference is going to be the critical thing. I think that's the reason that they tend not to be spoken of in terms of forming government. And I think they would, if you press them, uh, they, would, they would say, well, that's probably a reasonable view. Where they have an opportunity to do something, of course, is where you vote in a different way, not for the election of the government, but for the election of a Senate. So I'd agree with, with Barry on, uh, on those issues. In terms of revelations of science, if it motivates you, terrific. But if it paralyses you, then um, uh, with doom and gloom and fear and there's no point, then, then again, it, do, it doesn't take us anywhere. Uh, in terms of the Greens um, and all minor parties, uh, it seems to me that many of those supporters and their growing support, numbers of supporters are those who have abandoned the major parties because they're looking for an expression of hope in the case of the Greens. They're looking for an answer. But the, the, practical, out, the practical reality is they don't have power unless they can negotiate it. So if you look at a group of crossbench senators at the moment in, um, who hold wield power in the upper house, the government can't act without getting sufficient numbers of those crossbenchers on board. Now, the Greens have some of those numbers, but the reality is their agenda is marginalised uh, because they simply don't have the numbers. If their vision is to be uh, taken up in the mainstream, then they and their supporters need to be uh, smarter at communicating what that vision is. And I agree with you, media is a very critical component of that. They have to have airtime to be able to get that. And I guess the media are looking for who has the power, so. Yeah, I think you're always, you're always weighing up um, how, you know, is there any prospect of, uh, of third forces emerging in Australian politics? Because at the end of the day, uh, they will come into some alliance, uh, their values then, their supporters' confidence get compromised because they're in some either power-sharing arrangement and uh, you can sort of see that happening to, uh, to and, and third-party forces, for the reasons Barry was saying earlier, through election funding and, uh, and even the modest number of um, people who are on the ground to distribute things, uh, just like how to vote cards and other things, uh, is relevant to, to that. So it's hard to see how third-party forces in Australia uh, penetrate the House of Representatives, and uh, I think there is a real question about how um, all sorts of people uh, with integrity um, negotiate what is a common good in the Senate, and um, you know because it, it turns out to be a, a fairly base, uh, you know, trying to squeeze something out of a deal, and we'll we'll let something through that goes through a bit unexamined, and so uh, I, I think the uh, the ethical ethical point of the Senate is is probably a pretty um, a pointy one for people who really actually do desire to build on something for the common good. Well, perhaps we could finish with uh, my recollection of the exhortation offered to me by the young Barry Jones way back in the mid-1960s. <laughs> if you care enough, join a political party, whatever your political perspectives are, right or left, and get active. <laughs> Please thank our panel. I love that. Uh, since we're talking about hopefulness, let us uh, offer a prayer of hope. Loving God, we uh, thank you for all who participate in thinking about the kind of society we have. We pray that you would, uh, even for those people who feel uh, alienated or distracted, their voice isn't heard, 
help them seek virtue uh, that they might express in the, for the public good and be with those who are in elected political office, that they might weigh up uh, the choices they make, uh, the heavy responsibilities that they bear on behalf of others, uh, and uh, determine things which are to contribute to um, a sharing of many uh, good things and empowerment to many people. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So thank you for your participation once again.